Hi students, this is Jamie, and this recording, this recording is the Respiratory Disorders Chapter 19 in your textbook. Kind of a lot of information in this chapter, so I'll try not to go on and on and make this uh, video recording too long. I'm just going to highlight some of the um, disorders to make some clarification to help with uh, studying. I'm going to be doing something a little bit different. I'm going to be on the PowerPoint slides. I'm going to have questions. And we're going to kind of try and have kind of a dialogue. I don't we really can't because it's just me talking. But I'm going to ask you some questions. You can kind of think about what your answer would be. And then we'll talk. I'll talk about it anyway. And uh, hopefully you'll email me if you have questions. First thing I want to say is kind of the role of the PTA in interventions for the patients with respiratory diseases. After patients have been evaluated and treated by the PT and have been determined to be medically stable, uh, the PTA may treat patients with respiratory diseases. Um, you as a PTA need to remember that any changes in a patient's status must be immediately communicated to the nurse that's in charge of that patient and your physical therapist. Um, when you're working with someone who has some type of a respiratory disease, you are going to be looking at their oxygen saturation levels, which would be monitored with a pulse oximeter. I know in PTA 110 you got a chance to put out that pulse ox a little bit when you were learning vital signs. You'll continue to be able to practice um, doing the treatment using the pulse ox. We'll, we'll, I'll use it again in the winter when we go in PTA 113. But this is something that you're going to want to have with your patients. A lot of therapists in like a skilled nursing facility or even at the hospital carry a small, poxi uh, a small oximeter in their pocket that they kind of own, um, that they sterilize in between patients and it just simply fits on the finger. It gives them the heart rate, tells them the oxygen saturation. When you're working with someone with a respiratory disorder, you're definitely going to be talking with the nurse before you go in the to see the patient, to ask them how they've been doing. You're going to want to read in the chart, get some baseline vital signs, get some baseline O2 sats to kind of figure out what it is that is this patient's normal and what parameters you need to keep this patient in to keep them safe while working with them in the treatment. You may also be taking their blood pressure and pulse before, during, and after treatment. You might minimize a peak flow or an incentive parameter, and those are the when you think about if you visited someone in the hospital and usually by the bedside table there's a spirometer and it's a little plastic, I'm sorry I should have put a picture up here actually as I'm thinking about this, um, it's, it's something that they breathe into, there's usually a little ball in it, they try and breathe in and breathe out and to try and decide, try and get as much oxygen as they can in and out. It's something very simple that you could do with your patient as you're kind of starting your therapy. Because remember these patients, if they're respiratory and they've declined in, in their physical status, they haven't been taking deep breaths. They've been taking small, shallow breaths. They've been in a semi fowler position so that their chest isn't getting a chance to really expand and that can lead them to being susceptible to pneumonia. So even just the incentive spirometer is something that you could do in your beginning of treatment to work with your patient on taking deep breaths. You can also work on um, breathing techniques, diaphragmatic breathing, purslip breathing, some things that you're going to learn in the special topics class, um, but your book talks about them a little bit here. You're going to always want to be watching your patient, looking for signs. How's their color? How well are they talking? Um, if patients are talking like this and they're answering questions in short statements, you need to be aware of that. You need to take a look at that respiratory rate and see if it's increasing or decreasing. There are patients that this is the normal way they breathe because they're that short of breath. And you need to be aware of that and you need to make sure that you are controlling the therapy treatment within the parameters that are appropriate and safe for your patient. So that's my little spiel on uh, respiratory disorders, kind of getting you to start to think about what it would look like in the clinic. So let's go on some questions here. So you've read the book. You have watched a number of maybe the uh, videos that I've had on there. But let's try some questions. So explain the purpose of the specialized cells in a respiratory mucosa. So first of all, what are the specialized cells? 
those are the goblet cells, and their function is they secrete mucus to trap uh, the inhaled foreign particles before they can damage the lungs. And the three, three little hairs are what sweep away any secretions and foreign particles upward from the lungs to be coughed out. So that is the purpose of the specialized cells, which are the goblet cells. So they're, they're protected, they're the first line of defense for what you inhale into your, into your body. Describe the function of the external intercostal muscles. Okay, what would be the function of the external intercostal muscles? So this is kind of taking you back to kinesiology, right? When we study inspiration and expiration. Um, so the answer is, is that they raise and extend the ribs and sternum to enlarge the thoracic activity, the thoracic cavity, sorry. So the purpose of the external intercostals is that they enlarge, they expand the thoracic cavity. Describe the mechanism of and the energy required for quiet expiration and the forces for expiration. So what is quiet expiration? Quiet expiration involves the relaxation of the diaphragm and the external intercostals. And there is no, <clears throat> excuse me, there is no energy expenditure, right? It's the relaxation of the diaphragm. Forced expiration requires the energy to contract many muscles, and those are your internal intercostals, of course your abdominal muscles, and your neck and your shoulder muscles. So forced expiration is what requires the energy, um, not quiet expiration, because quiet expiration is just relaxing of the diaphragm, diaphragm and the external intercostals. Okay. Name the organism that commonly causes primary atypical pneumonia, okay, mycoplasma, <laughs> or uh, also known as influenza virus type A or type B, um, are the primary cause of atypical pneumonia. And if you're comparing the pathophysiological changes in viral and pneumococcal pneumonia, so Inflammation is interstitial, so it's around the alveoli in the viral pneumonia. In, in the pneumococcal pneumonia, the pneumonia actually results in the exudate, including red blood cells, that fills the alveoli. Um, both processes impair the diffusion of oxygen. But um, knowing that interstitial or viral, viral pneumonia is around the alveoli, whereas the pneumococcal pneumonia results in the ex exudate that fills the alveoli. So that's the difference between um, those two. And your book talks about that at length. So let me know if you're having trouble with that one. Explain why secondary bacterial infections may commonly follow viral infections in the respiratory tract of elderly patients. So why do you think that is? So why is it that um, someone who gets an uh, elderly patient who gets viral pneumonia, has viral pneumonia, is more susceptible to um, developing secondary bacterial infection, infections? Why is that? Well, remember an elderly patient, the immune system can already be suppressed. And that viral infection causes necrosis and inflammation of the respiratory mucosa. And so it's actually reducing the barrier to bacteria invading that patient. So they have the viral infection, it's all the cilia are being laid down, they're no longer doing their job, the goblet cells um, are not doing their job. And so really it just, their body is more susceptible um, because of the damage that the viral infection has already done and it's reduced the barrier so now they're more susceptible to getting a bacterial uh, infection. Okay, pretty straightforward. Explain why the anterior posterior diameter of the chest is increased in patients with emphysema. Well, I think I wanted to actually talk about um, emphysema first a little bit. I guess I kind of have that uh, slide a little out of order. Let me see here. Let me let me skip. Let me skip to emphysema. We'll just kind of I'll, I'll skip here. Let me turn over my 
direction of where I wanted to go. Um, let me see. Let me just tell you a little bit about uh, emphysema. So emphysema is a COPD, P COPD pulmonary condition. Um, remember, COPD is kind of this umbrella term that involves many different respiratory infections, emphysema being one of them. Um, approximately 94% of people with emphysema are over 45. It's become more prevalent in females than males in the United States. Um, the main cause, of course, of emphysema is cigarette smoking, but it is not known why some people do develop uh, like a chronic um, bronchitis and others get emphysema. They don't know why that is. Um, symptoms of emphysema. Okay, so when I was in school, they don't. This is kind of being obsolete now, but we learned about the chronic bronchitis, the blue blur. And the uh, the pink puffer is how we learned about it in school. And I know it's kind of it's a bit old school, um, but it's a really good way of kind of looking at your patients and figuring out who's got uh, chronic bronchitis and who's got emphysema because they really do follow these two classic looks. So the guy on um, your left there is the pink puffer, and the guy on the right is the blue bloater. So I don't know if they've tried to get rid of these terms, but when you look at them, you, know, you can see the obvious differences. And what are what are those differences as you look at them? Um, <clears throat> the pink pumper, <laughs> sometimes they call them, is a person where emphysema is the primary underlying pathology. And of course, emphysema results from the destruction of the airways distal to the terminal bronchiole which also includes the gradual dis destruction of the pulmonary capillary bed. And this decreases the inability to oxygen oxygenate the blood. So not only is there less surface area for gas exchange, there is also less vascular bed for the gas exchange. Um, but there is less ven ventilation or perfusion than with the blue bloater, so the guy on the right. Um, the body then has to compensate by hyperventilating. The arterial gra gases, which are called ABGs, your book talks about that, um, actually are relatively normal because of this compensatory um, hyperventilation. So these patients are always in this tripod position. So you see him, he's got his arms on his legs, he's leaning forward. This is very classic of a patient um, with emphysema. You can tell he's he's going to be short of breath. He would probably be on oxygen if you were going to work with him. He'd be talking to you in very short sentences. If you asked him to lay down or lay back to do exercises, he may refuse because he simply cannot catch his breath. This is the best way for him to catch his breath. Um, eventually, um, he will um, he will have some he will have low cardiac car oops, sorry low cardiac output. And, and because of that, people affect, affected with emphysema develop muscle wasting and weight loss. So notice how he is very thin. You can see the weight loss. You can see the wasting. Um, they actually have less um, hypoxemia than uh, the patient on the right there. And that's why they appear more pink than the other patients who... Um, kind of have a this blueness to them, and so a patient like the the man on the right here, he um, his primary underlying lung pathology is chronic bronchitis. And just a reminder that chronic bronchitis is caused by an excessive mucus production with airway obstruction, uh, re resulting with these uh, an increase of these mucus producing glands, and then they have chronic inflammation around the bronchia. Unlike emphysema, the pulmonary capillary bed is undamaged, and instead, the body responds to the increased obstruction by decreasing ventilation and increasing cardiac output. Uh, there is a uh, really dreadful um, ventilation to perfusion mismatch leading to hypoxemia, which is low uh, blood oxygen. and. Uh, Poly, um, let's see, no, yeah, so 
so the, okay, let me say that one more time. So there's a dreadful kind of a ventilation to perfusion mismatch between the hypo hypoxemia, which is the low blood oxygen, and, an, and the polycythemia, which is the increase in the red blood cir circulating throughout the body. Um, in addition, because of this, they almost have they also could have an increased carbon dioxide carbon dioxide retention. So they're getting too much carbon dioxide in their body; they can't blow it off. Because of this obstruction, their residual lung volume gradually increases, and that's why their chest gets bigger, and they begin to kind of bloat in the abdominal cavity. Um, they became they are um, hypoxemic. They become cyanotic um, because they have they become almost a, a blue. I mean, their lips can be blue. So those are kind of the differences between chronic bronchitis and emphysema, and as you can really see it in a patient. Um, some other uh, signs of uh, patients who have uh, emphysema would be they develop this uh, barrel-shaped chest. They call it a barrel-shaped chest. He's kind of got a picture of it where it's, you know, smaller down at the bottom. It's kind of wider up by his pecs. You can kind of see that. He's got the hyperventilation. He'll have a fast uh, respiratory rate because he's attempting to get more oxygen uptake. Um, he'll be using more of his accessory muscles for ventilation to try and increase the volume in the chest. Um, in the, in the beginning of stages with someone with emphysema, they're going to have shortness of breath only when they're exerting themselves. But as the emphysema progresses, um, they'll eventually have difficulty breathing at rest as well. Um, patients with emphysema do not produce sputum or exhibit a cough because there is no uh, bronchial obstruction or inflammation. So yeah, they're not coughing up. Uh, in, they're not coughing up sputum. That's uh, colored or copious versus someone with chronic bronchitis is going to have a, pro a productive cough and they're going to be coughing up a lot of this mucus because remember they have chronic bronchitis they have too much mucus going around in their body. Um, pathologically remember in emphysema the walls of the alveoli are destroyed by the enzymes released um, because of the inflammatory process going on in their body. Um, and this reducing of the surface area available um, decreases their ability to do gas exchange. Also, the walls of the alveoli lose their elasticity and they lose their ability to expand and recoil. Air within the alveoli okay, is, is uh, not able to be ex exhaled. Um, it's, they begin, um, they almost tend to stick to each other and they're not able to. They, I always kind of think of the alveoli as like little pillows in the, uh, uh, inside the lungs and, and they become, they're soft and they're pliable. I remember when I was autopsy assistant just feeling the uh, lung tissue and you could just squish it and you can really feel and, and hear the air come out of it. And with emphysema, this becomes scarred down. It, it does, it's not soft. It's not um, a movable tissue. Um, it becomes gray and black and, and, and hardened. Um, the prognosis for emphysema becomes a life-threatening uh, condition as the alveolar destruction becomes more advanced. And they also have a high possibility of risk of infection and serious complications as well. Uh, patients who have emphysema require oxygen therapy. They may carry oxygen, portable oxygen with them at all times. Um, in some cases, a transplant is a treatment option. Um, sometimes they'll use surgery to remove parts of the lung that are so damaged that uh, um, they'll, they'll actually remove them. Uh, the hard part for patients with emphysema is they have to stop smoking and I have treated patients who continue to smoke even though they have this very debilitating uh, disease. Um, they turn off the oxygen and then have a smoke and then they turn it back on. Um, pretty, uh, pretty sad diagnoses. Um, what else can I tell you about uh, chronic bronchitis? Um, I guess I've kind of, kind of in clinical terms, chronic bronchitis is determined when a productive cough is present for at least three months. 
of the year for two or more consecutive years. Um, of course, like I said, bronchitis is an inflammation of the bronchi that produces excessive secretions um, that are continually coughed up by the patient. In chronic bronchitis, the secretions are present for prolonged periods and lead to irrevers irreversible changes within the bronchi, resulting in blockage with the mucus plugs in the small bronchi and the bronchioles. Um, the main cause of chronic bronchitis is cigarette smoking. Other um, factors in, could be that could lead to chronic bronchitis could be environmental irritants, secondhand smoke, air pollution, occupational hazards such as asbestos, chemicals, types of dust. Uh, signs and symptoms, like I said, is the cough. There's um, also a difficulty breathing, a sensation of chest tightness. Swelling of the lower extremities may result from the right heart failure. And uh, patients have um, just a difficulty time breathing. Um, progression, of the, <clears throat> progression of the disease of chronic bronchitis is gradual over a number of years, resulting in pulmonary function and leading to progressive disability. Um, yeah. That's pretty much what I wanted to say about those two. So let's go back um, to where it kind of talked about it. So um, explaining, let's see, explain why the anterior posterior diameter of the chest is increased in a patient with emphysema. Okay, well, obstruction and the loss of elasticity leads to the air trapping and over lungs resulting in the, limb, in the ribs becoming fixed in an inspiratory um, position. Explain why hypercapnia may be a major pri problem in patients with emphysema. Uh, expiration and the removal of carbon dioxide is difficult because, like I said, the alveoli are, do not recoil and the obstructions par partially block the expiratory airflow. Forced expiration often collapses the damaged bronchial walls, resulting in more air trapping in the alveoli. They can't get that out. Um, those are the two, that's the major major problem with emphysema. The next slide, your book talks about uh, meconium ileus, and it's kind of like, wow, you know, we go from emphysema to meconium ileus. Uh, meconium ileus is an uh, intestinal obstruction in a newborn. It's a very thick, sticky meconium, which is a greenish black mass of mucus, um, cell debris, and bile that's been accumulating during the fetal development and, ex and excreted after birth. And it's, um, I'm trying to think if you, I mean, the book just really it defines it. Um, I'm not sure if there's really anything else. You just uh, this is one of those questions that's kind of a licensure questions and it's just they're just asking you <clears throat> to define it so I wanted to put it on there for you okay so talking about cystic fibrosis now and what is cystic fibrosis I hope you got the chance to look through Nina's story like I said Nina lives here in Ferndale and uh, I'm friends with their family and I actually cystic fibrosis has touched uh, me personally uh, with two of my friends my friend Laura there her daughter Nina and my best friend uh, Laura my other friend who's her name is Laura as well uh, she's a physical therapist assistant and when she was pregnant she found out that the baby girl was going to be born with cystic fibrosis and um, you have to be a both the mother and the father have to be a carer of this um, gene and this was before they did testing now there's testing that will um, actually test the mother um, in the first trimester to see if they're when the is see if they're a gene carrier. If the woman, if the mom is a gene car carrier and it comes positive, then they'll test the father. And then, then if the mother and the father are positive, then they're going to do an amniocentesis on the baby. But this was 10 years ago before they did this test. So there was, at that time, there was no test that, that tested um, during prenatal care. Um, it's a lung disorder. Um, so her, um, the, 
cystic fibrosis has come a long ways in the last few years. Physical therapy, it depends where you work, if, if cystic fibrosis will be something that you will work with or encounter. Um, cystic fibrosis is a, it's a hereditary recessive trait. Um, so both the parents have to have the gene, like I said. The disease results in a reduced pancreatic enzymes that cause the malfunction of the mucous membranes and the mucus producing glands of the pancreas and the lungs, which results in severe lung abnormalities. Um, the disease also affects the transport of chlorine ions within the body, uh, mainly affecting the pancreas and the lungs. And the effects of this are seen in intestinal malabsorption, problems due to the defects of the wall of the intestines, because of this excessive thick mucus. So in a patient with CF, they have too much mucus in their body. It's in their lungs, it's in their airway, it's in their intestines, uh, it's in their liver. It's a, the pancreas does not secrete the enzymes to, enzymes to break down the fat. So a CF patient will need to take actually take a pill of enzymes before they eat, especially if it's a fatty meal because their body does not produce its own enzymes. The mucus builds up in the lungs. Um, in the lungs, the areas are obstructed because this is a highly viscous, thick mucus. Um, it results in, you know, the air just can't get down in there. They can't get the air out. Um, it can result in a collapsed lung. It can result in increased infection because that mucus will trap bacteria in those lungs and they're susceptible to uh, multiple lung infections, multiple just general infections in the respiratory system. Um, and then the the uh, bile ducts are obstructed in the liver, um, causing inflammation of the liver, cirrhosis of the liver, and malabsorption problems. So these um, CF patients can be uh, thin uh, when the disease process is really um, lacking habit and is really um, tiring the body out. And um, as you read in Nina's story, so Nina at that time um, was on the transport list multiple times where the uh, transport list that, um, to see the, receive a transplant. There are certain criteria that you have to have in order to... Okay, I'm back. I got interrupted, so I have no idea where I was talking about. Um... So permanent damage can occur in the lungs because of the frequent infections. Um, I'm sorry, I got interrupted, so I'm not really sure where I was. Uh, what else can I tell you about cystic fibrosis? Cystic fibrosis, you're going to learn about even more about it in special topics. It used to be that we did, uh, we still do chest PT, and your book kind of talks about it, where it's a cupping with your hands. These are the, the children that were kind of laid upside down on a lap and they were clapped on their back and their side and then they were told to cough to try and get the mucus out. Now they have a, actually have a vest. It kind of reminds me, it looks like a police a police uh, bulletproof vest that they wear. kind of looks like that. And there are air hoses hooked up to it. It hooks up to a machine and it actually forces air into the vest and it does chest PT. And um, I'll, I'll I'll put a link to a video of that um, online, but so that that's really that's really helps CF patients because they have the vest all the way from a one year old all the way up to a forty year old can get these vests, and so they do this multiple times a day. They do inhalers, they do nebulizers, they do coughing treatment, um, they do exercise to help with um, their breathing of the rib cage. Um, the common one is the wheelbarrow. You know, the, if you remember that when you, were kid, when you were a kid, where you would walk on your hands and someone would lift your legs up and you'd have kind of races on the lawn. Um, that's one activity that's fantastic for a, for a child with CF because it's working on the muscles that they need on the trunk and the respiratory and the um, the thoracic cavity. 
And so that's one of the exercises that you'll see CF children doing, and they get very good at it. They go up and down stairs. Also, the trampoline is a nice, um, because that forces the diaphragm up. It helps with breathing. Uh, okay, well, I think I've talked about cystic fibrosis enough, and I, I hope you in, um, were able to take something away from Nina's story. Um, you can go to her blog. You can... There's all sorts of pictures on there of her surgery and her progression and how she survived and what an amazing uh, thing that is to have a double lung transplant. If you can imagine having your lungs removed and someone else is put inside you when you just have, Nina literally had weeks to live before she was going to uh, pass away and she got the gift of a, of a set of lungs. So her amazing story, and as you said, as you read last year, she did um, a, a race, and she is con still continuing to to run and bike, and she just has a new lease on life. So I I hope you were inspired um, by her story. Okay, so describe the uh, predisposing factors um, of, of a collapsed lung after surgery. Uh, why would that be? Why would that be? I'll let you kind of. Think about that for a for a second. Um, I kind of said it a little while ago, actually. So after someone has surgery, anyone has surgery, but this question in particular is talking about abdominal. They breathe shallow. Why? They're on pain medication. They were intubated. Um, they were. Uh, they have their degrees coughing. They're they're not coughing. They're not moving around. Um, they're not removing their secretions because they're on medications, because they're in pain, because they're in this recumbent position in the hospital bed. Um, they may have abdomen uh, distension, which is compressing the lungs because they've just had abdominal surgery. So someone who has a uh, collapsed lung, some of the signs and symptoms would be difficulty breathing, uh, fast heart rate, fast breathing, chest pain, asymmetrical chest movements. Um, so, and, and uh, you know, this is something that we're, why physical therapy is important to get, patient, uh, get patients up and moving. It's amazing what pain medication, you know, patients don't realize that they need to get up and uh, move around because they're feeling no pain. Um, and they don't like you to come move them around, but it's important because they're going to get pneumonia, they're going to get a DVT, there are many, many things that they could get from bed rest. Okay, we kind of talked about this. I'm going to try this. I don't, I'm not sure if it'll work or not, but this is just a one-minute video of a man um, who has COPD. He's kind of talking about his symptoms. You can kind of look at how he looks, listen to the pace of his speech, listen to his breathing, kind of hear his story. Um, I'm thinking though, are you going to be able to hear it? I think so. I think so. We'll try this. This is an experiment, guys. May not work, but hey. So how has COPD affected the quality of your life? You know, it's funny. Over time, gradually, I've noticed in being short of breath as uh, I didn't, I didn't, first thing I recognized, I guess, is I didn't have a lot of stamina. Even when I was working um, and being very physical in the work that I did, I'd have to stop halfway up crawling up a ladder. And over the years, um, it's digressed to the point where I can't go for walks anymore as much as I would like to. Uh, I have to take my time going downstairs and especially coming back upstairs. Uh, I can't do the things that I used to love to do. Play golf, ride motorcycles, swim, scuba dive. Uh, so all aspects of my life, it's other than reading, it's affected it greatly. Um, anything to do with being physical, because um, my lung capacity is just so diminished that uh, once again I have no stamina. So I know there's different classifications of COPD. Do you know how severe your COPD is at this point? The only thing that I've read or I've heard people talk of is that it's severe. I don't know if there's numbers involved or whatever, but it's uh, in my 
estimation, my definition would be severe COPD. Okay, so that was kind of just a quick